before we open the floor for questions, discussions, contributions, uh, we will have our last um, lecture for today, which will be given by Professor Edwin Etebo. Um, Edwin Etebo is a professor of philosophy at the University of Wits and an adjunct professor at the University of Alberta. He works primarily in African philosophy, ethics, applied ethics, and social, social, sorry, social political philosophy. He has authored, edited, and co-edited so many books and articles. Professor Edwin Etebo is the co-founder and secretary of the African Philosophy Society, a pan-African organization that organizes research, research clusters among African philosophers and men mentors promising and young scholars in African philosophy. He is presently the head of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Wits. The title of his lecture is, Unaniman, sorry, Unanimism, sorry, and the possibility of a communal mind. Um, Professor Etebo, please speak to us. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues, friends, for coming to uh, join us in this uh, tribute. And thanks to the CSP as well as the Center for Phenomenology in Africa for putting together this uh, this important tribute for the very important uh, African uh, philosopher. Uh, so I do have a draft, a very rough draft. So there would be some very rawness in some of the ideas in this draft. Um, which I would speak to and read uh, plus, uh, plus at appropriate uh, points to uh, pick up some of the ideas. Uh, but again, uh, as has been announced, the title of my um, presentation is Unanimism and the Possibility of a Communal Mind. <clears throat> so uh, I, I don't know Professor Pauline Otunji as well as maybe many of you do, uh, but I think I know him uh, enough to be able to say that he's, I think he's one of the greatest uh, philosophers I ever managed from the African continent. Um, besides being a philosopher, I, I would say that he is also a very lovely and good person. Um, he wrote one of the endorsements for my edited volume published in 2018 by Pangrave, Substance, Method, and the Future of African Philosophy. Uh, this is what he said um, about the, uh, the volume. This is an astounding and brilliant book, one of the most important collections on African philosophy that has recently been published. The book excellently engages with a number of important themes in philosophy and thereby makes a substantial contribution to the field. The editor, as well as the authors, both prominent and rising scholars in African philosophy, should be commended for bringing together this volume. Him writing the endorsements was a result of my first meeting with him at the second biennial African Philosophy World Conference organized by the African Philosophy Society in Calabar, October 12th to 14, 2017, seven years ago. We invited him as one of the keynote speakers. Um, there were many memorable moments throughout the three days of the conference, including, of course, assisting him with an important phone call that he said, I must make this evening. I have to make a phone call to be a republic. And it was difficult having to get him to make the phone call, but eventually we succeeded in helping him make a phone call. We interacted very closely, both at the conference venue and in the hotel where we all stayed, uh, all stayed in the same hotel. I recall one of those evenings where we were battling with uh, where to get some Nigeria currency. Uh, that's uh, folks who came from, uh, didn't exchange, exchange their currency, you know, so they had to think about where do I exchange currency so I can buy some local stuff. And some were looking for a local restaurant to eat. So there are people who were looking for where to change money. There were people who were looking for a local restaurant to eat. And Tunji stood there smiling and said to us, young men, can't you guys fast? You know, so that was the response to our trying to get a local restaurant um, where we could eat food. After the conference, um, um, we all left Calabar. Um, Tunji, myself, and a few others boarded the same flight. We sat close to each other and talked for over 
about one hour flight uh, time. Um, now we talked, of course, about a lot of different things. When we got to Lagos, we hired the same taxi to take him to his hotel, and then um, the other conference attendee had to go to her own hotel, and then I was left to now uh, go to my brother's place in Nigeria. Um, we continued the talk that we didn't finish on the flight uh, for another hour. And then, uh, of course, he mentioned that uh, he needs to rest a bit. Why would it for the driver to come from Kotonu to, to pick him up for them to drive from Lagos to Kotonu? Uh, so that was how we ended. After that, we, of course, we started changing correspondence. And uh, and that was how the endorsement uh, issue came up. My second meeting with him was the Dar es Salaam, um, the third Bayana African Philosophy Conference. Um, and uh, we talked quite a bit. And... One thing he told me was that Edwin, you are strong headed, you know, and what he meant by that was simply that after all our discussion um, in, uh, in in Calabar, that I see insisted that uh, ethno philosophy is uh, proper philosophy, and I give him the hard time that he's wrong in his view about ethno philosophy. So um, I just wanted to share a bit of. Uh, this is a picture of me. This is myself, Jonathan, and himself. We trying to get books uh, in Dar es Salaam. Um, and there is a picture of myself and himself. And he tried the whole time in Dar es Salaam. He gave me a hard time. And it's about African philosophy and ethno philosophy. I may be on ethno philosophy. Um, but, uh, so, so, what I want to speak about here would be uh, speaking to some of the, the discussion I have with him about. What I told him about why I think there is a space for ethno philosophy beyond his criticism. All right, I'm going to say that uh, come to that in a moment. All right, I just want to say a few things uh, about about Tonji. People have said a few things about him. So, um, Suleiman uh, Bashidang uh, from Columbia University in the U.S. described his work as very important and very liberating in an interview. In his preface to the book Holly Tonji. Liko de Philosophie Africana, which is edited by Bado Ndoye, published two years ago, not yet translated to English. Uh, 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 Suleiman Dan calls uh, Hutonji the most influential figure in, in philosophy in Africa. Pascal Mugwini in UNISA, University of South Africa, in a 2022, 2022 book on African philosophy, emancipation and practice, published by Bloomsbury, says that Hutonji's critique of ethno philosophy enjoys canonical status in contemporary African philosophy, he adds, is a philosophical masterpiece. We may quibble with some of the status conferred here on Mutonji because we might think that there are other great, greater African philosophers or great African philosophers like Kwasi Weredo, Bayeme Kriti, Kwame Jeshe, Barihale, etc. But I'm not here to make a comparison analysis of who is greater, who is the greatest. But I want to say, of course, um, whatever I would say is that Hutunji would be one of the greatest, given what he's done. And we've seen some of the presentations from both um, um, uh, Dr. Sanya and uh, from Kame. We've seen some of his cont contribution that makes him one of the greatest African philosopher. Now, I want to talk briefly about his uh, his, his motivations. Uh, some of the motivations have already been provided by by uh, Dr. Sanya, uh, his motivations behind his rejections of ethno philosophy. In doing this, let us keep in mind that his principal target or line of attack seems to be Placid Temple's book, Bantu Philosophy, and by extension, the French anthropologist Marcel Grill's work in 1965 titled Conversations with Ogotomele, an introduction to Dogon religious ideas. The first is the, fir the first motivation for Butonji for rejecting ethno philosophy as proper philosophy is philosophical, and of course, it gets the idea of unanimism. The central thesis for Tempo's Bantu philosophy is that for the Bantu or African being, being means force, and force means being. Butonji's disagreement with Tempo is not so much about whether it is the case that there is something that can be said about being meaning force in African cultural or traditional worldview, but the very fact that Tempo presents this as philosophy or African philosophy. For Tunji, the whole approach of Tempo was flawed 
He argues that philosophy can't emanate from a group, but rather must be the responsibility of individual philosophers. This is his inf influence from um, Edmund Hose's uh, phenomenology. Of course, as we know, uh, Butonji uh, was uh, a student of, of phenomenology, and Hose was one of his uh, work he did when he was in the PhD. Butonji says this in a 1997 memoir, Compass Polisens, Ordinary African which is published in English in 2002 as a struggle for meaning, reflections on philosophy, culture, and democracy in Africa. It is. The construction of, as a norm for all Africans, past, present, and future, of a form of thinking, a system of belief, which could at best only correspond to an already determined stage of intellectual journey of Black people. In other words, it's saying that African ethnophilosophy presents Africans as if they have one mind. He says further, what was thus presented as Bantu philosophy was not really the philosophy of the Bantu, but of temples and engaged only the responsibility of the Benjamin missionary, having become for the oppression, the analysis of the ways and customs of the Bantu. The bigger motivation for Utoji is intellectual here. Utoji's motivations are twofold. First, he wants to free African thinkers from a long established set of beliefs to which European thinkers like temples, and the French anthropologist Marcel Gros had chained them. Second, he was interested in the non-contamination of ideas and beliefs, or what can be said to be the purity of African ideas and beliefs. And to do this, you have to be you have to divorce the ideas and beliefs of anthropological trappings and grandees so for which ethnophilosophy philosophy uh, falls victim. Otoji says this in the 2022 Radio France interview. What a Beja Francisca was offered was really a system of collective thought, which was supposedly a positive African attribute. This is not the sense of the word philosophy. The third motivation is political and pragmatic. For Utunji, it is important to reject unanimity in African thought, as this can and have been used to justify the dictatorship and human rights violations in Africa. This view is one that Otoji had and had a first-hand experience when in the late 1970s he taught philosophy at universities in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which was then Zaire, where the strong man Bokutu Seseko had sway and used traditional African philosophy or philosophy to justify, according to Otoji, the worst excesses, the most atrocious human rights violations. In a nutshell, the unanimous message of view of the notion that Africans all spoke with one voice is problematic, not just for the dictatorship in Africa, as exemplified by Ubuntu Suseseko in the DRC, but in the intellectual work of people like Tempos and Grill, who contributed to training African thinkers to European thinking, thereby denying Africans the possibility of purity of ideas and belief. Now, I want to talk about I've talked about his motivation. I want to talk about the possibility of a communal mind. The whole point would be if there is a possibility of a communal mind, then it opens up the space to think of philosophy as broader than the narrow conception of philosophy as wedded to an individual mind. All right. What I'll be doing uh, here would be then to use this uh, idea that philosophy can be a property of communal mind to make a case that that allows us to talk meaningfully of ethno philosophy as, as some kind of uh, proper philosophy. In doing this, I'll be engaging with concepts like the extended mind, group mind, collective intentionality. Now, of course, my other point here is to say that uh, underlying this intellectual and philosophical motivation for Tonji is the idea about philosophy is a rational activity. Um, and it being a rational activity, it has to be a property of an individual mind because rationality is a product of an individual mind. Uh, philosophical, critical thinking, rigor, as uh, we've heard from uh, uh, Dr. Saya, uh, it's simply property of an individual mind. If you think of rationality as encompassing reason, thinking, logic, and rigor, and all of that. So let's begin first with the idea of an extended mind. In philosophy of mind, there's a talk of the extended mind thesis, which simply holds that the mind extends into the physical world. 
and does not completely reside in the brain or even the body. The, physical, the physical world here will include some objects in the external environment, such as computers, tablets, phones, calculations, diaries, and other objects that store information and that form part of a cognitive process and in a way function as extensions of the mind itself, right? So the idea in philosophy of mind of an extended mind is the idea that the mind is not just residing in your skull, your head, and that external objects form part of the mind. So uh, if you think about the mind as processing information, storing information, so any object that helps you to recollect, store objects, would then be part of your mind. So the mind is not just here yeah, in your head, the mind is all over the place. The point of this is that the mind is not just about the small head body of an individual. It is bigger than that. It extends beyond that, beyond the individual. This ties with the other concepts, which is the idea of group mind. The idea of group mind is the idea that believes desires come on to a social group as a whole or collective consciousness of a group of individuals. So the idea is that the group has a mind. The idea used to be that, of course, individuals are the bearers of mind. But according to some more recent um, research, you know, work in philosophy of mind, cognitive science, is that there is a meaningful discussion around the idea of group mind. So a group can have mind. It's not just the individual that can have a mind. This also ties in with the other idea of collective intentionality, where collective intentionality refers to the power of minds to be jointly or collecti co collectively directed at objects, matters of facts, states of affairs, goals, or values. Collective intentionality comes in a variety of modes, including shared intention, joint attention, shared belief, collective acceptance, and collective emotion. So let me sort of illustrate this idea of collective intentionality or communal intentionality or split of a group mind. Let's take the following two examples about crowd and people. Supposing I say the crowd is mad. If I say the crowd is mad, what am I saying? Of course, I'm referring to individuals in the crowd, but I'm speaking here of a group. The crowd is mad. I'm ascribing intentionality to the crowd. The possibility that this crowd has some kind of thought, some kind of thinking. Here, the crowd is mad. The second example is when we say, for example, the people have decided. Okay, where again you are ascribing intentionality to the to group. Yeah, you're not you're talking about individuals that make up the group. Of course, if you work in philosophy of mind, there's debate as to whether are you just referring to the sum total of individual minds in that group, or are you referring to a new phenomenon which is different from the individual uh uh that make up the group? And that's the debate in philosophy of mind, the cognitive science there is argument for both sides, but I'm not interested in those debates. My interest is to say, it doesn't matter whether you say it's a sum total of individual minds or intentionality or it's a new, whatever, it, 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 the virtual intentionality or, or thought. What I'm interested in is that at least you, what you are saying by using this, this term is that there is a possibility of a communal mind, a mind that is not just an individual mind, even if you think there's an aggregation of individual minds. All right. In both examples, there's unanimity, only insofar as the emotion in the first example, the crowd is mad, is attributed to the crowd, and the people have decided is attributed to the people as a group. But this does not suggest that everyone in the crowd is, and or everyone among the people agrees with the decision, does it? If they say the people are mad, and there may be some people who may not be mad that you know if you say the people have decided the people who have not decided so take example the idea of democracy where we say oh uh they've elected a new leader so the people have decided elected probably not everybody have elected the leaders they have the minority that probably voted for a different candidate a different party so the idea that um that when you ascribe some people a group that calls for the idea of unanimity. That means everybody in that group shares the same account of intentionality or thought process or cognitive state. Uh, doesn't sound, doesn't seem to me to be, to be true. 
I think the mistake that critics of unanimity make is that they assume, and I think wrongly, one, that unanimity effaces individuality, that the very fact we ascribe unanimity to a group, therefore individuals die. I, I think that is the wrong thinking. Second uh, mistake is that unanimity means there must be complete agreement. That's the idea here, which is again wrong. That the fact there's unanimity doesn't mean there's complete agreement. I, I was, I would illustrate this. Uh, so if we remember, if those of us who are working in uh, consensual democracy, will remember Kwasi Weredo's point or discussion in consensual democracy. In Weredo's consensual democracy, it talks about unanimity of decisions as agreement in action, but not necessarily agreement in and of belief. In other words, for what we do, when we make decisions in the context of consensual democracy, we have to suspend our beliefs or simply put them in abeyance in order for us to reach a decision and follow through to such decisions. That's why I call it agreement in action. That we have a decision means there's unanimity. But that there's unanimity does not mean that individual beliefs are not peculiar in the background. In fact, they say you suspend them. They sit there. Because they keep coming up every time. There's people who say, oh, well, but this is my belief was different from X, Y, Z. But of course, the only reason we agree for unanimity for action is because we need to practically make a decision. It just means that because of agreement in action, the divergent ideas or beliefs that are put in abeyance don't seem to be visible. If you like, you call them dormant. They are dormant. But there is unanimity in agreement in action. So the point I'm trying to make is that the mistake people make to just say, oh, well, the problem with ethno philosophy is that it uh, lumps all African voices or people together think that there's unanimity uh, and they are all speaking in one voice. They all they don't have uh, their individuality. Uh, the, the mistake simply is to think that um, that. You can have you, you can have unanimity in, in in action, but not have unanimity in beliefs. Um, as consensual democracy has as John. So let's take the example of proverbs, a proverb which has been discussed a lot as a source of ethno philosophy in African philosophy. Uh, proverbs are one line statement that tell us a lot about reality, values, and beliefs. Proverbs, according to Campbell Momo, entail some metaphysical principle. By this, it means a principle that speaks some that speaks to some critical portion of reality. Um, this idea of an overarching significance of proverb is sensible and understandable, given that we are here talking of traditional uh, African societies that have no writing and use proverb as one of the sources of expressing values, beliefs, and understanding reality. A proverb example of unanimity of decision with respect to some ideas, values, or beliefs? Yes, I think so. Because proverbs do not fall from the sky, but come to being through some process in the community and representative of a definite way of thinking about issues and reality. In fact, within a community, there may be competing proverbs that may suggest a tension between different voices and taking society. Now, I will say a bit more about proverbs, just um, maybe during the discussion. But the point is, in a society that is not literate, a proverb constitutes one of the sources of storing values, beliefs, ideas about the thinking of the community. Proverbs don't come forth from the sky. There are many possible ways in which proverbs could have, could have emerged in African societies. One possible way, which I think is probably plausible, is that, is that proverbs are, 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 are used, obviously, to codify the critical thinking that have been espoused by individual members of society, probably respected philosophers or elder society. And of course, the proverbs don't bear the name of anybody, partly because we're talking about communal societies where individuality, where people, where, where, where the community is usually taken to proceed, uh, to take precedence over indiv individuals. So, uh, so the proverbs emerge from individual thinking about, 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 about the world, engaging with, with, with reality and values, and they get appropriated by the community and become part of what you might call the communal wisdom of, of, of people. Now, now, the proverbs, as you find out in African societies, they can different proverbs that attack each other, that are competing proverbs, that, that say different things, you know, and all that. 
that for me may be even an indication of the fact that those competing proverbs may be proverbs that also emerge from different voices, the critical for different reasons of maybe the dominant ideas espoused by individual thinkers in society, which also find their way around and all that. So what we should probably be doing is maybe if we have if we have the means, is to actually be asking ourselves how did this proverb come to become property of the community? Uh, and so rather than saying, oh, these proverbs are common thought, therefore as common thought, they don't exhibit thinking, they don't exhibit criticalness. Um, but I have shown the criticalness, thinking, rationality is not just a property of an individual mind, it can also be a property of communal mind, of group mind. So the question of whether ethnophilosophy can be defended as philosophy turns on some understanding of philosophy and rationality. If one takes philosophy to be a purely rational activity or as rationality, and if one holds rationality to be a property of an individuated or individual mind, as Otonji seems to hold, then one may prescribe unanimism and the possibility of a communal mind. However, if one does take rationality as a property of an individual mind, um, and even if one takes philosophy to be a purely rational activity, but also think that philosophy can also be a property of communal mind uh, in virtue of discussion around extended mind, group mind, in collective intentionality, then one will make allowance for unanimity and the possibility of a communal thinking and a communal mind. Let me now briefly touch on the political and pragmatic motivation that I said, uh, that, that, that was also one of the reasons why uh, Utoji wants to reject ethno-philosophy or unanimity. Recall that on this motivation, he's point is that it has been used by some politicians or political figures to justify dictatorship and human rights violations in Africa. Now, there's a couple of things to say here. First, if people use traditional philosophy to justify or hide the worst excesses, the most atrocious human rights violations, then perhaps the first thing to ask is whether the content of what these people parade as, as traditional philosophy is really traditional African philosophy, or a distorted version of African philosophy. This point is important considering that Eurocentric school scholars have distorted a lot of what currently stands as African culture or cultures. And with such distortions of African cultures, it's not highly unlikely that what may have been presented or paraded as traditional African philosophy, which is being used to oppress other people, may be one of those distortions. The second point I, I do want to make is I suppose that we reject traditional African philosophy for the reason that Wotoji wants us to do. It is not clear to me that what difference will it make in terms of sidestepping human rights? In other words, people who still want to actually sidestep human rights will still find other ways of sidestepping human rights uh, uh, and do all of these violations that he, he's worried about. Unless, of course, Wotoji is saying that there's nothing like African traditions or cultures because accepting that there's something like African traditions or cultures means there's unanimity, at least in that sense, because when it's African traditions or African culture, there's unanimity. But I don't think Utoje would say that when you take an African culture or tradition, everybody in society agrees with that. No. I, I find this view, namely, that there's African traditions or culture, but there can't be unanimity with African tradition and culture quite not compelling. Or, of course, the idea is that Africans, of course, don't have one voice, which is true. But if you say African cultures or traditions, you are, in a sense, talking about unanimity of cultures or traditions. So the point simply is that when people like, I saw one of the discussions I kept having with him, I said, well, well you know, Baba Otoji, when, when you were talking about those philosophy, you were working in a time where Cognitive science has not developed to a point now where people are talking about group mind, collective intentionality, extended mind. And once you begin to talk about all of this, then the idea that seems to take, take the traditional idea, the orthodox view that take rationality or mind or thought or thinking to just be situated within an individual now becomes questionable. And once you extend up the possibility of a mind beyond the individual to group thinking, rationality to group, then the idea that communal thinking or communal thought in ethno-philosophy is problematic just by the very fact that thinking or philosophy can only be done by individual becomes then problematic. Thank I'm you very sorry much. To, 
Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. you. You ended at the right time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Prof, for your insightful lecture on 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 and missing and the possibility of communal mind. Thank you so much. Um